Wow. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody. I can see about half the congregation here. All right. The, uh, it's wonderful to be with you today on this Good Friday. Uh, we just had a wonderful uh, beginning at Trinity Episcopal Church. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church, where we will hear both the second and third word from the cross. And by that, I mean uh, we are very fortunate here and that we have a close, loving relationship with our friends across the street at Fifth Street Baptist Church. Their sanctuary is currently under construction. So they're going to do the third word of the cross uh, from this location. And we haven't yet decided if we're going to walk the cross around a couple of times, the sanctuary, before we start. Uh, we had a volunteer. <laughs> uh, th there is no paper bulletin for our worship time today, but the, the words uh, will be on the screens in front of you. J just a couple of items um, to, to be thinking about. If you are a fan of Samuel Clemens, uh, his family w was, uh, were members of this congregation, and Sam grew up in the first building uh, that the Presbyterians had. It was on 4th Street, very close to where Trinity Episcopal Church is today. Uh, Sam was actually in this sanctuary uh, in late May and early June 1902. He delivered lectures and attended worship here. And then uh, when he died in April of 1910, there was a memorial service held here. Now, his, his funeral was in Elmira, New York, but his, there was a, a service here. Now, some of you may be aware that Sam Clemens turned into a, an agnostic in his later years. Please know that we had nothing to do with that. Uh, I, I encourage you to please join me in the call to worship. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. Who redeems us from sin and death. For us and for our salvation, Christ became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Please rise as you are able as we'll sing hymn 175, Alleluia, what a Savior. Please remain standing as we do the prayer of invocation. Merciful Lord, as we gather today, we remember the supreme sacrifice of your Son and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was led like a lamb to slaughter, clothed in humility and grace. He willingly offered himself to death so that we might live forever. We're thankful for his love on a horrid wooden cross. Today we dwell on the pain he bore for us. And we're grateful for the forgiveness that he offers. And we worship and praise now. Help us to live in the wonder of his goodness and to marvel at his grace. grace.
Amen. Amen. Thank you. You'll forgive me if I'm twitching a little bit. I get very nervous when the choir's behind me. And rightly so. The second word from the cross comes to us from Luke 23, 43. And he, Jesus, said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Will you please pray with me? Lord God, may the meditations of all of our hearts gathered here this day, and may the words that flow from my lips truly be pleasing in your sight. For Lord, you are both our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The presence of crosses and crucifixes everywhere around us has served to desensitize us to the appalling horror of the act of crucifixion. I am certain that in every sanctuary that we enter this afternoon, we will see beautiful examples of crosses. Often in our busy day-to-day -day lives, we pass depictions of the crucifixion that we barely give a notice to. We would not be so cauterized, though, if we had, ev if we had ever seen a real-life crucifixion, as had many inhabitants living in the first-century Roman world. Cultured Gentiles were so offended by the cross that they refrained as much as possible from even mentioning that word. Once, in the late first century, just a short time after Jesus' own crucifixion, an upper-class Roman actor performed a mime depiction of the crucifixion. It was, it was a, not the crucifixion of Jesus, but of a thief. And the writer, you may have studied him when you were looking at the classics in high school, Decimus Junius Juvenalis was so repulsed that a member of the patrician class would debase himself that he said he hoped the actor would end up on a real cross himself. There was nothing beautiful about crucifixion. In the March 21st, 1986 issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, there was an article that recreated the horror of the most exhaustive medical review of Jesus' crucifixion ever published in a medical journal. In fact, when you go home today, if you look up the title on the physical death of Jesus Christ online, it'll pop up. It's free, and you can read it. The authors detailed the pain of the Roman flagellum as it tore into Jesus' skeletal muscles, the pain produced by the weight of his body hanging from spikes that penetrated the medial nerves and tore at the tarsals, the gruesome respiratory agony, the cramping, the ensuring pleural effusions, concluding that, quote, death by crucifixion was in every sense of the word excruciating. As Jesus hung on the cross or on the pole, Right. The Greek word staros can mean pole or cross. Insults came from many of the religious leaders of Jerusalem. And soon, the Roman group of soldiers, the five who were charged with his crucifixion, the cruciari, they joined in the insults. We read shortly before our verse for today, the soldiers mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. The apostle Peter, in the second chapter of his first letter, would record Jesus' regal silence from the cross as fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 9. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. In Luke's account, we learn that after a while, one of the two thieves crucified near Jesus fell silent, but the other continued to hurl insults at him. We read one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and save us. Tragically, this man expressed no thought of God, no guilt, no sin, no repentance, no concern for forgiveness, and ominously he heard no word from Jesus, no argument, no warning, only silence. 
And amid the chaotic shouts of acrimony at the Lord, a solo voice of spiritual sanity rang out from, of all people, the other thief. We read the other thief rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Undoubtedly, his silence had been brought on by a spiritual awakening. He had seen the meekness with which Jesus had let himself be led to this punishment. Likely, he'd heard Jesus charging the grieving daughters of Jerusalem to weep for themselves. He had heard Jesus' prayer for his executioners. And in that prayer, Jesus had addressed God as Father with an unheard of intimacy and love. And most of all, there was an obvious contrast between the holiness of Jesus and his own crimes. And this awakened in him a beautiful posture of grace. He knew that he was a sinner. That's a word we often forget about when it comes to Jesus on the cross. And we indeed justly, he said, are crucified, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. He owned his crucifixion as a just civil punishment. And the thief likewise knew he had no merit to which he could appeal for Jesus' help. Such a clear awareness of sin is a profound advantage over most of humanity. Most people live in a foggy world of ambiguity and relativism, falling in love with the dark contours of their own lives, convincing themselves that their sins are noble and glorious, that their pride is dignity, and their unwillingness to forgive is actually character. No such haze clouded this man's soul. In this spirit, he turned to address Jesus, who he concluded was the Messiah, the anointed one of God, king of the coming kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He did not say, remember my works. Neither did he say, remember that I align myself with you in your death. He only said, remember me. He asked for mercy. And that is all any of us can ask for. The dying words of the devout astronomer Copernicus, where I do not ask for the grace that you gave Paul, nor can I dare to ask for the grace that you granted to Peter, but the mercy which you did show to the dying robber, that mercy, please God, show to me. The suffering Savior was no longer silent. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And the word translated paradise bore the root meaning of a garden. And it came to represent the future bliss of God's people. It was understood as describing that intermediate place of rest where souls of the righteous dead dwell prior to the great bodily resurrection when Jesus will return in all of his glory to renew the cosmos. This was an astounding promise to that crucified criminal, made even more so by its immediacy. The thief had asked that he would be granted life at Jesus appearing to establish his kingdom. But Jesus' answer promised immediate entry into paradise on the very day of his crucifixion. And to compound the astonished immediacy, Jesus told that wretched man, today you will be with me. You will be with me, close by me. Luke's account of the cross is not about a good thief, but about a sinful, wretched thief and a good, kind, loving, self-sacrificing Savior. That Savior is Emmanuel. He is God with us. That Savior is Jesus. He saves. Amen.
Welcome to the third word from the cross presented to you by the uh, Fifth Street Baptist Church. My name is Tom Carpenter. I'm pastor there and I want to welcome you on behalf of my congregation. And I want to say a very hearty thank you to the Presbyterian Church, the brothers and sisters here who have allowed us to tag into their service today and we can take part in this way. I want to uh, share with you the scripture where our words are taken from today. They're taken from John, the 19th chapter, starting at the 25th verse. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her to be in his home. Today, we want to present to you a time for Mary to speak as she's at the cross. Out of my body. How can this be? This is impossible. There's just no way that you could have done all these things that they're saying you did. You don't deserve this kind of treatment. You just don't deserve this. Oh, I wish you knew him. He was so special from the very beginning. His arrival was so miraculous and holy. All of the events before and during his birth were so special. He was the fulfillment of all of God's promises. He was God's child. He was God's son. But he was my baby. He was my first child. He was my son, too. I remember that night he was born in Bethlehem, like it was just yesterday. I was so young and so afraid, so scared. I wanted my mother near, but all I had was poor, sweet little Joseph. God took care of us that night. 
He provided everything we needed, and we knew it was a holy night. The shepherds were so excited when they came to visit us, and they were the ones that got to see Jesus for the very first time. They told us about all of the amazing events that they saw. The shepherds, or the angels came, that first angel came and told them what was going to happen, and then all of the angels came. They were the first ones to see Jesus. And then I remember the prophet of God in the temple telling me to be prepared for the pain that was coming because Jesus was my child. He warned me that my heart would break, that I was going to be torn apart, that my soul would be pierced. It broke my heart to watch him pull away from me and the family to become a rabbi. Oh, son, I had to let you go. I had to watch you encounter the ridicule from our friends and from our family. I knew it wasn't right, but I wanted to hold you close. I wanted you safe. I wanted you near me. I wanted you away from all the trouble that was surrounding you. And now, and now I'm watching you suffer. You're sacrificing yourself. The crowds are all stirred up in a frenzy, and they're wanting you crucified. And I wince at every strike of the hammer as it goes into your feet and into your hands. And I'm crushed every time you moan and you, and you utter pain. I can't handle it. My heart is breaking, son. And yet in the midst of all of this, in all the pain you're enduring, you're not thinking of yourself. You're thinking of me. You've got the grace to make preparations for me. You're telling me you're placing me in the hands of your dear friend John and that he's going to take care of me. Oh, my son, what love, what sacrifice, what grace. I don't deserve to be your mother. I don't deserve your compassion. Once again, I know and I confirm that you are the Son Most High. Jesus, my little boy. Jesus, my lamb. <clears throat> Jesus, my Lord. Yeah. 
Will you please join me in the unison prayer? Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, was lifted high upon the cross so that he might draw the whole world to himself. Grant that we, who glory in his death for our salvation, may also glory in his call to take up our cross and follow him. Through Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. I invite you to please rise for the verses 1 and 4 of When I Survey the Wonders. Join with me as we say the benediction together. Gracious, gracious Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ, has lifted high upon the cross. So that he might draw the whole world to himself. Grant that we who glory in his death for our salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.